Praise God, praise God. Well, it's so good to be um, with you this morning again. Thank you for your prayers for last week. I was a bit poorly last week, but praise God. You know, God is good still. Amen. In our sickness, we still praise Him. In our weakness, we still praise Him. Whatever the season, we still praise Him. Amen. Praise God. So this morning, um, I want to speak to us about this topic that God has laid in my heart. And I want to speak to us about this fact that God is not done with us yet. Amen. Say it with me. God is not done with me yet. Turn to your favorite neighbor and say to them, God is not done with you yet. Turn to your not so favorite neighbor and tell them, God is not done with you yet. (laughs) Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. If you've got your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 and we're going to read from verse 14. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. And this is a letter Paul's writing to the body of believers in a place called Rome. And Paul starts his letter by these words in chapter 7, verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual. Everyone says spiritual. But I am unspiritual, Paul says. He says the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. That sounds a bit like me. (laughs) And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. And it it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Like I said, this letter is from Paul to Romans. And this letter is rather unique considering some of his other letters. You see, with his other letters, Paul instantly jumps to the practical problems and deals with them straight away. However, in this letter, it is a different situation. You see, he did not have anything to do with the founding of this church. Whereas with other churches, he was there, he was the founder, he was part of the founding of the churches, but, but in particularly with this one, he had nothing to do with the founding of this church. And also, he had no personal contact with them. You see, Rome was the greatest city in the world, the capital of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. So when Paul heard about these gatherings that were taking place in Rome, he was excited. He was passionate to connect with them. He was eager to connect with them and hear and know more about what was happening in their context. You see, so why is Paul writing this letter? Firstly, I want to suggest to give them an overview of Paul's own theological position. In other words, Paul, he was one of the characters in the Bible who was out and about ministering the gospel in various different contexts, very different places. And there was a lot of rumor that was spreading about him, saying how he was preaching heresy, how he was preaching the gospel that wasn't of Jesus Christ, how he wasn't there with Jesus himself. So there was a lot of rumors that were spreading around in different churches. So when Paul first heard about these believers in Rome, he says, do you know what, I need to get things clear with them. I need to let them know where I stand, what my theological position is, where I stand in terms of my love and my passion for Jesus. And secondly, he's writing to them to prevent them from making the same mistakes the other churches had been making which was actually allowing themselves open and making themselves open to other gospel, which was no gospel at all. And that's why we hear Paul writing to other churches, especially Galatians. He's writing to them, um, you were running a good race, but who cut it in you? In other words, you were so passionate, so fired up for Jesus, but what happened to your passion? How all of a sudden you've lost your passion? What happened to you? Because they were now compromising the message of the gospel. They were now compromising their own conviction. And they were opening up themselves to the things that weren't godly. So to prevent that, Paul is also writing this letter to help them understand what has been happening with other churches. And thirdly, he's writing to establish partnership with this church as 
Mark mentioned earlier on, you know, our journey is not meant to be journeyed alone. Our journey is meant to be journeyed in a context of community. Amen. And this is why in the very book of the Bible, Genesis, God says to Adam, it is not good for a man to be alone. It is not good for anyone to be alone. We're in this together. Together, we can achieve more for the kingdom. Amen. We can achieve more for the kingdom. So when we read Romans 6, this is Romans 7, but when we see, read Romans 7, we understand that those who are dead in sin are now alive in Christ. Amen. Those who were dead in sin now are alive in Christ. But it also strikes another challenging question in that same chapter. Paul goes on to say, Just because there is an abundance of grace, should we continue in our sin? That's another powerful, challenging question. Just because there's an abundance of grace, does that mean we continue in our sin? Okay? And in other words, what he's really saying is the challenge is real. The challenge is real. And I love the fact that now he jumps into chapter 7 and is expanding what he really meant in chapter 6 about his struggle with sin. Paul's not talking about any other person's struggle with sin. He's talking about his own struggle with sin. Okay? He's talking about his own struggle with sin. So when we get to chapter 7, he's opening to them about his struggles with sin. And you see, some scholars suggest that perhaps maybe when he's talking about his struggles with sin, he's talking in the past tense, in the sense of he used to once struggle with sin, and now he does not struggle with sin anymore. And there are other scholars who bring their own theological understanding and stand view on this. But however, I want to suggest to us that Paul is talking about his past struggle with sins, but he's also talking about his present struggle with sin. Okay? Paul saying, I used to struggle with sin, but it's another thing. I still struggle with sin. I still struggle with sin. So let's get to verse 14. Okay, verse 14, it says, we know that the law is spiritual. Paul brings his view. We know that the law is spiritual. In other words, he's saying the law is God's word. The law is God's word. Law was passed on to um, uh, people in the Old Testament by God himself. You see, the law is spiritual. And he goes on to say that it did not come from man, but from God himself. The law was not from man, but what for, was from God himself. And also what he's saying is, thirdly, is this. The law is God's standard. Firstly, the law is God's word. Secondly, the law did not come from man. Thirdly, the law is God's standard. In other words, it exposes our nature. It exposes our motives. It exposes our thoughts and our actions. But I love the honesty of Paul in this. He goes on to say, the law is spiritual, but it is I. I am unspiritual, he says. I am unspiritual. You see, the problem is not the word of God. The problem is I. The problem is me. Paul is saying, and I am the problem, Paul is saying, and I, I think that's a powerful confession right there from a man who traveled uh, around the world, preaching the gospel, planning many churches, but yet he is standing um, in conviction and, and proclaiming that it is I, I am the problem. I'm not here to blame anybody. I'm not here to blame my situation. I'm not here to bring up excuses for why I'm not where I should be. But here's the thing. I, myself, I am the problem. I love this quote by Paul David Tripp. And here he says, here's how the gospel growth works. This is a book I was reading a couple of months ago, a book called Lead, and it talks about 12 gospel principles for leadership in the church. And um, he's, he's the leader of leaders, Paul David Tripp. And in his analysis um, of the gospel, in his analysis of counseling many leaders and counseling many people, he's come to this conclusion that you cannot grieve what you do not see. You cannot grieve what you do not see. You cannot confess what you haven't grieved and you cannot repent of what you haven't confessed that old ancient biblical 
principle of repentance, the art of repentance, the call of repentance. See, in other words, what he's saying is for us to truly understand what's taking place in us, firstly, we have to see what's taking place in us. And we have to acknowledge that everything that takes place in our lives is not always godly. It starts with that acknowledgement. Perhaps the problem is I. The pro- perhaps the problem is me. Perhaps the problem is what I have inside of me that God needs to help me deal with. And secondly, once you recognize that, it says you have to grieve. In other words, you have to hate that sin. I cannot live my life the way I'm living it. Something needs to change. Something has to change. And thirdly, confession. We have to confess it before the Lord. Confession is good, I want to say to us. Confession is good for the soul. Renewal starts with confession. Repentance starts with confession. Change starts with confession. I want to suggest to us that confession is good for the soul. Amen? Confession is good for the soul. In other words, what Paul is saying is, I am the one who is struggling. I am the one who needs help. I am the one who needs redeeming. I am the one who needs saving. I want to strike, so I want to, give, I want to um, give us a question. Have you ever been tired in a journey? Have you ever been tired in a journey? And I want to uh, also say to us that there's three levels of tiredness. Three levels of tiredness, okay? The first level, is t- the first level of tiredness is this, healthy tired. Healthy tired. I love healthy tired. It's the kind of tiredness, you know, where you're like, yes, I've done something today. It's the kind of tiredness where you, you reach your end of the week and you're like, whoa, I've cleared a lot of junk in my house today. I've tidied my garden. You know, I've, I've made a difference in somebody's life. And you can just sit back, chill, and watch a good movie on Netflix. That's the kind of healthy tiredness I'm talking about. I love that tiredness. But sadly, there's another kind of tiredness as well. This is called unhealthy tiredness. Unhealthy tiredness. This is the kind of tiredness where you are high on stress. I've never been there. You guys believe that, do you? (laughs) Always. I'm there always. Ask my wife. (laughs) This is the high on stress kind of tiredness. I'm I'm stressed out. I'm like, whoa, there's so much that needs to be done. I'm just so tired. And you become so unproductive. You're not sleeping enough. And there's just so much to do. And your list just goes on and on and on and on. And you've not ticked any of the boxes. And your mind is just so fried up that you just want to just sit and do nothing. That's unhealthy tiredness. But sadly, there's another tiredness as well. And this is Dangerous tiredness. Dangerous tiredness. This is a tiredness where you've lost touch with your soul. That you've now forgotten who you really are. That you've forgotten your true identity. That all of a sudden the passion once you had in you has now disappeared. That all of a sudden now you just want to quit. And there is no drive within you anymore. You've just burned out. And can I just say this? I believe Paul had experienced all these free tiredness. He knows what it's like, like to, what, what it's like to experience healthy tired. He knows what it's like to experience unhealthy tired. He knows what it's like to experience dangerous tiredness. And can I be the one to confess? I go through them three tiredness all the time. Sometimes I'm going through healthy tiredness where I'm like, yes, I've, I've done something today. And some days I'm going through unhealthy tiredness where I'm just so stressed out. And some days I'm going through dangerous tiredness where all of a sudden I feel so burned out that there's no passion to continue. There's no drive to continue anymore. And and you ask yourself the questions of what's the point of doing this anymore? What's the point of it all? What's the point of it all? You know, statistics shows that most men, it is mainly men who are committing suicide these days than women. And it is also men who are most likely to have heart attacks than women. And do you know why that is? Because us men, we keep our pain inside of us. Women, they're good at sharing their pain. Women, they're good at sharing their emotions, their thoughts. But us men, you know, I don't know. It's just maybe how God's wired us, you know. When somebody asks us how we're doing, we just say, yeah, good, I'm fine, thank you. 
And that's it. We don't really like to open up as much. And you see, we see that pattern all the way through the Bible. And that's why, this is why, even when um, Adam and Eve, they were hiding in the garden, God was calling them. God really wanted to see if they would really open up what was happening inside of them. He knew where they were, but he wanted them to open up their struggles. He wanted them to open up where they were in their journey. You see, the enemy will tell us that you can do it in your own strength. The enemy will tell us, you don't have to share it with anybody. The enemy will tell us, listen, nobody cares about you anyway, so why share? Why bother someone with your burden? Those are the lies from the devil. But I want to help us with the truth. The truth is this, when you share, you are setting yourself free. Amen? When we share with one another, we are setting ourselves free. Free. Secondly, when we confess it to God, we are opening ourselves to God. When I'm there before God and His presence, I'm saying, God, I'm struggling. I'm saying, God, I cannot do it in my own strength. I need that supernatural strength of yours. God, fill me with your power. Fill me with your strength. And then He can start the work in us. Then He can start the work in us. When Adam and Eve finally came out of hiding in the Genesis, then God started the work in them. When David finally came out of his hiding and confessed of his adulterous acts, then God did a work in him. When we finally come out of our hiding and come before God, then God will begin his work in us. Verse 15. I do not understand what I do. I do not understand what I do. For for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. You see, Paul's problem here is not the lack of desire. And I want to say to us, our problem is not the lack of desire. We all desire change, don't we? We all desire to do good. We all desire to live righteously. But here's the problem. Paul lacks power. And so do we. We lack power as well. We lack power. You see, Paul discovers that he is not only sinful, but also helpless because of indwelling sin in him. And you see, sometimes we are quick to respond in our own abilities, in our understanding, rather than learning to trust God and trust in his understanding. See, I do not understand why some some of the things happen. See, I don't understand why some of the things are taking place. But God does. He sees it all. He understands it all. See, God knows where we truly are today. And God knows what's happening inside of us. And you see, here's the challenging truth. Sometimes God allows things to take place in us to bring us to a place of surrender. Let me say that again. Sometimes God allows things to take place in us so that he can bring us to that place of surrender. Just an example, my son, you know Joshua, everybody knows Joshua. <laughs> he's such a lively character. Um, he's running around everywhere, and especially when we go out for walks and things like that. You know, I try to uh, grab hold of his hands, and he's always pulling his hand away, and he, he, he thinks he, he loves his independence. I don't know if that's the word. <laughs> you know, he, um, he, he, he likes to do his own thing, you know, and he doesn't like being told what to do and what not to do. Um, I don't know where he gets it from. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, that's my son, my son Joshua. I love him. I love him to bits, you know, when he was first born. I was in the, in the theater room. You know, it was a very painful day for us. My wife, she went through a very painful um, birth pe- uh, yeah, session. And um, in the end, they had to settle for a Caesarean operation. So I was there in the theater room when they were cutting her up and pulling out the baby. And it was, it was very emotional day. But, you know, when they gave me the baby, when they gave me Joshua and I held him in my arms, I just broke down in tears. I was there, you know, like, I was sobbing, I was sobbing, I was so embarrassed, <laughs> but I was sobbing my heart out. I looked at him and I said, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you. You know, I've, that day, I, all of a sudden, I experienced this level of love. I didn't know it was in me. Um, I didn't know I could have this level of love for anybody, and there it was, you know. I looked at my son and I said, I love you, my son. Um, but um, here we go, you know, now, 
I still love him, all right? <laughs> Just so that everybody knows, I still love him. So when we go out for walks and things like that, he likes to run around. And sometimes I try to grab hold of his hands, but he's always pulling his, his hands out. And, um, and one day we were going somewhere, and I knew these roads were rough. But he still wanted to just not grab my hand and do his own thing. So I let him be. I let him go. He ran. He fell down. Okay, he starts crying. I picked him up, and I was holding his hand again. And he pulls his hands again, and he falls down again. And after three, four times of that same thing, he comes up to me, and he holds my hand. And he begins to walk with me. You see, my son did not understand why he had to hold my hand. But I did. See, and sometimes we don't understand why we have to trust in God, but he does. And it's because of us sometimes we just think we know best, we know better, and we just run away and we just do our own thing. But I want to suggest to us, if we hold on to God, we are in safe hands. He knows what's best for us. Amen? He knows what's best for us. Verse 19 and 20 says this. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. For, I, for if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. You see, you can hear the frustration of Paul. Paul is frustrated. He's just sick and tired. He's frustrated. He's recognizing there are two forces at work in him, the old nature and the new nature. Has anyone been there? The old nature and the new nature. The old nature trying to pull him to the old ways and the new nature trying to push him to the new ways. See, we need to develop a holy hatred towards sin. We need to learn to hate the sin. And I want to say, don't play with sin. Sin will devour you if you continue to play with it. Now when we get to verse 24. Okay, if you've got your Bibles with you. Verse 24. Paul goes on to say, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What a wretched man I am, Paul says. See, wretched, in Greek, it also means distressed. It also means miserable. It also means one who is desperate for deliverance. When Paul says, oh, what a wretched man, he's like, I'm desperate for redeeming. I'm desperate for deliverance. Will someone come and set me free? He is one who is overwhelmed with a sense of his own powerlessness and sinfulness. You see, he's gone through from how will I deliver myself? You can hear those words in, in the previous verses. How will I deliver myself? I've tried this. I've tried that. It did not work. How will I deliver myself? And now he moves from how will I deliver myself to who will deliver me? He moves from, how will I deliver myself to, who will deliver me? Now hear these words in verse 24. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's moving from self-reliance to surrender. He's saying, I've tried my ways. It does not work. He's saying, I've done in my own strength. I've not been able to do it. And I want to say to his church, come on, stop trying to work it out in your own strength. Let's stop trying to work it out in our own strength. We won't be able to do it because we have not got the capacity to deal and overcome the powers of sin. Just stop. Just stop. You don't have to fight this battle alone. I don't have to fight this battle alone. We don't have to fight this battle alone. Paul finally looks outside of him. He was looking inside of him. All the time. And I want to say to you, sometimes when we look inside of him, we can get so lost in our own helpless state that we forget that there is a help outside of us. And his name is Jesus. Amen. His name is Jesus. Don't look at your mess. Look to God. See, when we focus on our own mess, it stops us from praising God. It stops us from moving forward. See, the enemy wants to look at ourselves and just have a pity party, but God wants us to look up. He wants us to look to him. God wants us to look to him. To sum it up, Paul, I believe, was trying to communicate this one powerful yet simple truth, and I want to give you that same truth this morning, church. God is not done with you yet. Amen? God is not done with me yet. God is not done with us yet. Yet our story is not over yet. 
The enemy would like to tell us that your story, this is it. You've messed up. This is the end. But I want to say to us, our story is not over yet because God is not done with us yet. Amen. Yes, I understand the difficult journey. Yes, I understand the journey is difficult. But I want to say to us, don't stop. Don't stop there. Yes, we keep messing things up, but don't give up. Yes, the things we want to do, we don't always do it, but don't quit because the story is not over yet. The story is not over yet. God is not done with us yet. And this one more now I want to remind to us. I'm going to remind us, remind us of this truth. We have a Savior, and He is more than able. We have a healer. If we need healing, He is more than able. We have a provider. If we need provision, He is more than able. We have a rescuer. If we need rescuing, He is more than able. We have a redeemer. If we need redeeming from your sin, He is more than able. And His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. We sang that song earlier on. I speak the name of Jesus over all every anxiety, over every depression, over every sickness, over every bondages. I speak the name of Jesus. There's power in the name. You see, the one who rescued us is still rescuing us. He rescued us from the powers of sin. But it's us, we keep running back to that power of sin again and again. And that's why he is still rescuing us. Amen. And the story does not stop there. And he will continue to rescue us, amen. He will continue to rescue us. He will continue to redeem us. He will continue to save us. He will continue to forgive us. He will continue to lift us up. Wow, if that's not a liberating truth, I don't know what will liberate you this morning. (laughs) Because that is a liberating truth for me, amen. God, because I couldn't, God did it for me. Because I was not able to do it for myself, God did it for me. Because we, could not, we couldn't save ourselves from the power of sin. Jesus, he did it for us. You see, one of the most beautiful scriptures in the Bible is found in Romans. Again, Romans chapter 5. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. While we still continue to sin, Christ will still happily die for us. That's the power of grace. That's the power of grace. That's what Paul is saying here. You see, you don't have to walk with shame anymore. As I was praying into the scripture, you know, God gave me these words, and I'm going to speak it over your life this morning. He is in the business of, hear these two words, rescuing and restoring. He is in the business of rescuing and restoring. As Paul said, who will rescue me from the powers of sin? Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. See, you don't have to walk with shame anymore. You don't have to walk with shame anymore. You don't have to walk with guilt anymore. Your sins does not define you. Your past does not define you. So don't carry the baggage with you. Instead, this is the word I got for you, church, this morning. Instead, walk with your head held high. Walk with your head held high. As I was praying, I felt like, you know, because of what might have happened in our life, we're walking with shame. We're walking with guilt. But the word of the Lord to us this morning is this. Walk with your held head. What am I saying? Walk with your head held high. Amen. I'm going to walk with my head held high. I'm going to praise him with my head held high. Because the word of God reminds us where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So church, our story is not over yet. Our story is not over yet because he is not done with us yet. So just to finish, let me read those verses again. Who will rescue us from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He delivers us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Praise God.